So why the vegetarian advantage? What is it that gives plant-based diets an advantage over uh, omnivorous diets? And, and the reason is simple. Plant-based diets work because they address the root causes of the diseases. So how do they do this? Well, they do this by reducing our risk of overconsumption, but also by essentially disabling the drivers of chronic disease. Inflammation, oxidative stress, lipotoxicity, and dysbiosis. And so we're going to look at each one of those very briefly. First, inflammation. Chronic, low-grade inflammation is associated with pretty much every chronic disease you can think of. It increases our risk of cardiovascular disease by weakening fibrous caps, increasing risk of rupture, increasing plaque formation. They do all, inflammation does all kinds of things that increases risk of cardiovascular disease. For diabetes, inflammation interferes with insulin signaling. So insulin can't do its job, essentially. And that increases insulin resistance. And for cancer, it increases uh, tumor growth. It triggers the loss of, of uh, proteins involved with DNA repair. So it's bad news all around. So we want to reduce this low-grade inflammation. And if we look at the levels of inflammation in people eating plant-based diets versus those eating animal-centered diets, we see a huge difference. There was a systematic review and meta-analysis done in 2017 that showed vegetarian diets had a favorable effect on a marker of inflammation called HSCRP, which is C-reactive protein. If a person had been vegetarian at least two years, of eight studies, six found lower levels in vegetarians, one found no difference, and one actually found uh, slightly higher levels. We have only two studies that I know of on vegans, and the first is from Brazil. They showed vegans had about half the levels of CRP that omnivores do. And the second was a study from the United States showing about the same, except people eating a Western diet had levels of 2.61 milligrams per liter compared to vegans at about 0.5. And vegans were about 0.5 in both of these studies, which is highly protective against chronic disease. Oxidative stress is another one of the drivers of chronic disease, and it induces damage to proteins, to DNA, to cell membranes, and it increases the development progression and complications that are associated with chronic diseases. And we have multiple studies showing that vegetarians, including vegans, have more favorable uh, antioxidant status because they eat more antioxidants. It's really that simple. And they eat fewer pro-oxidants. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. Lipotoxicity. This is something that a lot of people have never even heard of. But what lipotoxicity is, is the accumulation of fat in places where fat shouldn't accumulate. Okay, so for example, where do we store most of our fat? In our adipose tissue. Right? We have this special tissue that has an unlimited capacity to store fat. When we, we get over, when our bodies get overwhelmed trying to store fat, we sometimes start to store it in places it shouldn't be, like our liver, our heart, our pancreas. And when these organs sto store fat, they don't function very well. And that is lipotoxicity. We also store it in our muscle tissue as well. And this causes cell damage and cell death. It causes inflammation. It causes mitochondrial dysfunction. It causes insulin resistance. It causes elevated triglycerides and elevated blood glucose. And so what causes lipotoxicity? Well, overconsumption leading to overweight and obesity are the biggest drivers of lipotoxicity. But diets that are high in fat, high in saturated fat, high in trans fatty acids also increase lipotoxicity. Also, diets high in refined carbohydrates, particularly sugars, with fructose being more problematic than other sugars. 
But fructose is a bit of a story in of itself because, of course, fruit has a lot of natural fructose. But our bodies can handle the amount of fructose in fruit. Fruit comes packaged with fiber and phytochemicals and all of these wonderful protective components. And the amount of fructose that comes in our system is slow enough for the enzymes are in, in our intestines to be able to convert it to glucose and to lactate and to other things before it enters the body. It's when we're drinking the stuff down in sodas that we, we, our bodies, our intestinal tract gets overwhelmed and we get more fructose leaking into the, into the bloodstream and it gets shuttled to the liver uh, very rapidly and the liver gets overwhelmed and it gets turned into lipids quite quickly in that case to be stored. And it's more glycotoxic than glucose. Now there's a plant-based advantage here again. Vegans have the lowest rates of overweight and obesity of all dietary categories. They have the lowest intake of saturated fat and they have lower levels of something called intramyocellular lipids. And intramyocellular lipids are a marker of lipotoxicity. And finally, dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is really just when sort of bad gut bacteria start to overrun the good gut bacteria. So you have an imbalance and, and you end up with a, an unhealthy gut microbiota. And um, the integrity of the gut microbiota is really important because when it's out of whack, you get a decrease in your supply of essential nutrients, you get reduced immune function, increased inflammation and oxidative stress and an elevated risk of obesity and chronic disease. There is an advantage, again, for people eating plant-based. There was a study out of Brazil in 2017 that found vegans had the most favorable microbiota of any dietary category, followed by lacto-ovo-vegetarians. And the author conclusions was exposure to animal foods may favor an intestinal environment which could trigger systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. And in Italy, another study in 2017 found lacto-ovo vegetarians had the most favorable microbiota followed by the vegans. And both uh, plant-based diets reduced uh, um, genotoxicity, which is that, that they were less toxic to our genes. So, and then the most effective dietary patterns are really simply patterns that minimize pathogenic or harmful components and maximize protective components. And so when you think about that, you think about all the things in foods that are protective, automatically we think of things like fiber and phytochemicals and plant enzymes and antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds and plant sterols and sterols and stanols and pre and probiotics and macronutrients from healthy sources and micronutrients from healthy sources. And when you look at this list, the thing that kind of just stands out is that, first of all, fiber, where does it come from? Fiber comes from plants and only plants, um, phytochem um, uh, phytochemicals, plants and only plants, uh, antioxidants, mostly plants. Um, anti-inflammatory compounds, mostly plants. And then the plant sterols and stanols uh, are only plants. And, and pre and probiotics are really mostly plants. Uh, prebiotics are certainly only plants. Probiotics can be in, in, in any fermented food. But you get the picture. The things that protect us most are the things that are concentrated in plant foods. And we're going to talk, I think it's tomorrow, about uh, low-carb diets. And one of the big concerns I have about low-carb diets is they're removing so many of the foods that are so intensely protective to human health. They're minimizing fiber in the diet, not maximizing it. There's no way you can construct a diet that is, you know, super low in carbohydrates, which is the predominant macronutrient of plants, and, and get optimal longevity and, and uh, disease risk reduction. It's impossible. If you look at the pathogenic factors in foods, trans fatty acids, excessive saturated fat, 
refined carbohydrates, excessive sodium, new 5GC, chemical contaminants, products of high temperature cooking, pro-oxidants, TMAO. If you look at these things, well, trans, where, where do they come from? Remember the, what the World Health Organization said, two categories of foods, processed foods and animal products rich in saturated fats. You look down this list, trans fatty acids, processed foods, excessive saturated fat, mainly animal products, refined carbohydrates, processed foods, sodium processed foods, new 5GC is a pro-inflammatory molecule in meat, especially red meat. Meat, chemical contaminants tend to move up the food chain. Products of high temperature cooking, well, whatever we're cooking at very high temperatures, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Pro-oxidants, things like heme iron, animal products, TMAO, is a trimethylamine and oxide, which is formed from carnitine in meat. So it goes into the, you know, into the digestive tract and the bacteria there will convert it into TMA and then it goes to the liver and it gets converted to TMAO. And this stuff is highly atherogenic. It increases plaque formation. It increases risk of kidney disease and so on. Not a good thing. Vegans don't even have the bacteria in their gut to make TMA. So we don't produce this stuff at all. It's just another uh, protection. And then endotoxins. Um, endotoxins are, are sort of the, the outer uh, membrane of gram-negative bacteria, the harmful bacteria. And, and you can, when your bad gut bacteria breaks down, it can produce endotoxins that can leak into the bloodstream, increasing inflammation. But you can also eat it in things like hamburger. There's a lot of these. Uh, dead bacteria in those products. And so now if you look at the, the, the actual, what we actually eat in the United States, 39% of the calories come from added fats, oils, and sugars. 30% comes from animal foods. 22% comes from grains, 90 plus percent of which are refined. So refined, uh, white starch, white sugar products. 9% come from vegetables, fruits, and legumes, probably half of which are orange juice and ketchup. So, you know, we've got a problem. So it, it's not rocket science why people are getting these chronic diseases. Most of what we eat is a threat to health. So this is a problem. Fortunately, we have a choice. And when people make the right choice, miracles happen. It's just incredible how powerful. When you think about when a diet is, is, is um, lifestyle induced, the only thing that will ever dramatically change that is extreme lifestyle changes. You know, every single cell of the human body is a product of what we put in our mouths. It would make no sense to think that it doesn't impact it us. It has to. And so I'm, you know, when I first started working in the Marshall Islands, I was absolutely awestruck by the rate at which this change happens. We had people that, that you know, were barely able to walk across a room when we first saw them. They'd had painful legs for 20 years, and within a week, it was gone. It was just shocking. So, so I wanted to share a story with you because this is, I've, I've shared this story before, but it really is my favorite story uh, about uh, dramatic change. And it's my favorite story because of the way it happened. Um, this is Andreas, and he received a very rare ca cancer diagnosis when he was about 36 years old. He made a um, huge shift from being a food and wine aficionado to a whole food, plant-based diet devotee. And his cancer went into remission. Um, now, Andreas, when I say he was a food, food and wine aficionado, I mean, that it's, it's an understatement, really. Uh, he, his favorite pastime was eating in the best restaurants, buying the biggest steak and the most expensive bottle of wine on the menu. I remember him telling me that he and his wife flew to Paris for the weekend to eat in one of the 10 best restaurants in the world, and they paid $3,000 for their meal. So he really was, food was very important to him. 
So you can imagine going from that to eating 100% whole food, plant-based, no oil, no sugar, no nothing processed at all. This was a big change for Andreas. But what I love about this story is his whole foodie family, his parents, his brother, his brother's family, they all said, Andreas, whatever diet you're doing, we're doing with you. Because we always want to be able to eat as a family, and we want to support you. So they were all willing to give up all of these foods they love to support uh, Andreas. And, and it was unbelievable what happened to the whole family. And I'm not going to tell you what happened to the whole family. I'm just going to tell you what happened to his father, Carlos. See, Carlos had type 2 diabetes. He was diagnosed with it in 93. Uh, he had just had a serious heart attack the year before his son was diagnosed with cancer. He had hypertension. He had high cholesterol. He had peripheral artery disease. He was in early stage renal failure. And he had recurring gout. He had cataracts. And, and the doctor said he would need uh, surgery within a, with a year or so. His prognosis, uh, he was told by his doctors that all of his diseases were progressive and irreversible and that he could expect to live about two years. He was being treated with 17 pills a day and 30 to 40 units of insulin. After less than one year on a whole food plant-based diet, Carlos was taking zero insulin and zero pills. Here, it's, it's really quite, quite amazing considering his doctors told him he'd be dead in a couple of years. So his fasting glucose went down to 80 to 87 milligrams per deciliter. His A1C was 5.1. Blood pressure, 115 over 70. They couldn't get it to that on two medications. His arteries opened up without any surgery. They did a PET scan. I'll show you one of his reports. Uh, he ha his peripheral artery disease disappeared. His kidney function normalized, went right back to normal. He didn't have one single further recurrence of gout after becoming plant-based. His cataracts stopped growing, and the doctor said he didn't need surgery anymore. And seven, seven years later, Carlos is still medication, uh, still free of all of these diseases and the medications he was on for them. And so here's his coronary artery disease reports. 2005, uh, he had very severe coronary artery disease with, a, with an inferior wall infarct. He had hypokinesis. He had um, an ejection fraction of about 50%. This is all um, you know, Greek to many people, but it's just very severe coronary artery disease. In 2017, this is 12 years later, no evidence of abnormal cardiac activity no evidence for reversible perfusion defects, no evidence of ischemia, normal chamber size, normal ejection fraction. It's really quite amazing. And, and you know, before I even go into this, I want to tell you that he went back to his doctor and he said, why didn't you tell me that all I had to do was change my diet and I could cure myself? And his doctor looked at him and he said, I didn't tell you because I didn't know. He said, I do now. He said, to be honest with you, if somebody would have told me this was possible, I would have laughed at them. He said, but I've seen it with my own eyes now, and I know it's possible. So not everyone is willing to make the kind of changes that Carlos made, but I believe that everyone has a right to know that lifestyle changes are a safe and highly effective treatment option. At the very least, when the physician lays the options out on the table, it should be among them. And people have a right to choose. 